Good morning. Turn with me to Acts chapter 15 as we continue to read through and study the book of Acts. We look this morning at Acts chapter 15. I'll start reading in verse 1 all the way through to chapter 16 verse 5. Acts 15 1 through 16 5. Hear now the word of our Lord. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to make from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen, and will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old." Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. When it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord to choose men and send them to you uh, uh, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, They went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. 
But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. They all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Here is the living and active word of our God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Lord, as the dry ground receives the life-giving rain, now we pray that our dry hearts will receive the life-giving word applied to us by your Spirit. Help us now with focused hearts and minds, with listening ears, and with reverent joy. Behold Jesus Christ in this word, and thus grow in conformity to him, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is quite a chapter. Calvin himself remarks that this is the watershed moment in the book of Acts. The gospel has been spreading. The church of Christ has been growing. Local churches are being established, not just in Jerusalem, but now increasingly in Gentile lands. We've seen clear opposition to the church as well, haven't we? These attacks on the church have either been external or, in some cases, even internal, if you know what I mean. External, like persecution, uh, imprisoning preachers, stoning Christians like Paul. But sometimes the opposition has been internal, like unchecked sin, and spiritual attacks. One of the biggest internal attacks, well, it was internal. And it was so big that it was about to rock the church, and it was that of doctrinal confusion. Theological controversy which threatened to undermine the church entirely because it threatened to undermine the gospel that the church believed in. If we could see inside the mind of Satan for a moment, I think it, we would hear something like this. If persecution won't stop the spread of the gospel... And sin won't kill the church because they keep each other accountable, or even sometimes they excommunicate those who won't repent. Well, then I know. Maybe we can get the church to adopt another gospel altogether. They'll keep their unity, sure. But we'll get them to believe in something so subtly close to the gospel. But it won't, in fact, be the gospel. And if we can get the church to champion something else other than the gospel, even if it's just a few degrees off from the true gospel, well, we don't care if they put the name of Jesus on it or not. Anything that's not the gospel will undermine the true gospel, and therefore we will have the upper hand. So what was this other gospel? Well, the Gentile mission, as we've been reading about, has been gathering momentum, has it not? The trickle of Gentile conversions was no longer just a few Gentiles here and there, but now an actual torrent of Gentile believers. Of course, the Jewish leaders had no difficulty with the general concept of Gentiles here and there believing. The Old Testament did speak of their inclusion, but now it seemed like the number of Gentile believers was not just outpacing Jewish believers, but doubling, quadrupling the Jewish population altogether. And so a particular question was forming in their minds. 
okay, if this is going to happen, what are the means of incorporation that these Gentiles are to be brought into the believing community of God? How did God intend the Gentiles to join into this gospel that the Jews has brought them? We've had God's word. We've had God's law for generations, thousands of years. How is God bringing these Gentiles now into that covenant community of which we remind you it was the Jews who gave the world the Messiah? Jesus was Jewish. If you believe in Jesus, you believe in a Jewish Jesus. Throughout the Old Testament, the practice of bringing Gentiles into the Jewish communion, into the covenant people of God, was through circumcision. And through that would come obedience to God's revealed law. That by observing the law, Gentiles could then acknowledge and be acknowledged as bona fide members of the covenant people of God. But now, something else entirely different seems to be happening. Now, Gentile converts were being welcomed into fellowship by baptism, but without circumcision. They were becoming Christians without also becoming Jews. And so what does this mean for the law that God had actually given to the Jews? God doesn't change, and so presumably His laws don't change either. So don't they have to obey those laws too? These new Gentile believers, they were retaining their own identity uh, and integrity as members of other nations and people groups. They were believing in this Jewish Jesus, but, you know, they'd believe in Jesus, great, but they didn't stop eating pork. <laughs> uh, they'd believe in Jesus, beautiful, but, but they kept wearing mixed fabrics. They would believe in Jesus, but they didn't take to themselves that most ancient of signs, the one God himself commanded Abraham and Moses, get circumcised. Was God's covenant people now in danger of becoming whitewashed through mass Gentile inclusion? Well, chapter 15 really does mark the turning point, the centerpiece of the book of Acts. And, and this is not an exaggeration. John Stott, in his commentary, writes that in this chapter, yes, Jerusalem is still the focus of interest. And Peter makes his final appearance in the story. But from now on, Peter disappears. Peter is to be replaced by Paul, and Jerusalem recedes into the background as Paul pushes on beyond Asia and into Europe, and Rome appears on the horizon. Indeed, we ourselves, from our later perspective today in church history, can see the crucial importance of this first council in Jerusalem. Here is the first major creed produced by the church. Again, as John Stott puts it, the council's unanimous decision liberated the gospel from its Jewish swaddling cloths into being God's message for all humankind and gave the Jewish Gentile church a self-conscious identity as the reconciled people of God, the one body of Christ. So let's look at how all of this came about. First, I want us to see in verses 1 through 5, theological dissension. Theological dissension. Look at verses 1 and 2. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, quote, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas, verse 2, had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. There's the position. Certain men were teaching in the churches that unless you were circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. The question of salvation is on the line. In other words, this is a primary issue. In other words, there are theological controversies, theological dissensions, we'd all agree, that happen within any given church that are not pr primary issues. Uh, they're secondary or maybe even tertiary. They may be important, but someone's eternal destiny isn't necessarily on the line if you get this one wrong. Here, here salvation is on the line. This is no small issue. 
And Luke tells us that Paul and Barnabas had no small debate with these guys before the council in Jerusalem was called. I take, I want to lay my cards out here on the table, I take the position that, that Paul's letter to the Galatians was written before this event that we're reading about now in Acts chapter 15. Galatians gives us a kind of insider look at what this debate was all about. Uh, you see, one, the cities that Paul helped plant in Lystra and Iconium and the surrounding areas, these were cities in southern Galatia. Second, the fact that Paul never mentions the Jerusalem council in his letter highly suggests that the events of Acts 15 had not yet happened. So in other words, we can learn something about this debate by reading the letter to the Galatians. And it's not for nothing that Paul will call these false teachers troublemakers. For indeed, the gospel they taught was so troublesome that people's eternal life was at stake. These troublemakers were essentially pitting James, the brother of Jesus, against the apostle Paul. James, if you've read the letter of James, says that faith without works is dead. Amen. There it is. True faith, a true and living faith, is an obedient faith. Works are produced out of faith. A works-producing faith. And yet Paul was clear in his teachings, wasn't he? That faith alone is what justifies a sinner. Faith alone is what makes you right and righteous before God. So which is it? Paul, James, how can these two be reconciled? And if James is right, doesn't that mean that our works must be works in keeping with God's law? Isn't God's law clear? God's covenant people must be circumcised? Shouldn't the Mosaic law give us some guiding contours of exactly how God's people should live? In fact, so dissentious was this controversy that it seems that even, even the apostle Peter got it wrong. Paul tells us about this in Galatians chapter 1 and 2. Listen, Paul says this, After three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that is Peter, and I remained with him for 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Interesting that these guys, Paul, Peter, and James, are the three guys that speak up in this Jerusalem council. Anyway, Paul continues, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. He hung out. He ate food that they ate. Bacon? I'll have some. But when they came, that is, these Jewish brothers sent from James, Peter drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically. Along with them, says Paul, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct, that it was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? In other words, these Judaizers, as Paul will call them later, they were seeking to make obedience to all of the Mosaic covenant, all of the old Mosaic law, a continued and necessary component of full and final salvation. And because of this egregious error, this is why Paul concluded his story about confronting Peter. He says this, Remember, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. No, says Paul, by works of the law, no one will be justified. Justified. That's the issue. The true heart of this controversy. By what ground is someone declared and counted righteous in the eyes of God? On what grounds is someone declared and counted righteous before the eyes of God? Is it faith in Jesus plus our works? Plus our obedience to God's law? Or is it simply by faith in Jesus alone? And Paul's answer, indeed the answer that arises from this very Jerusalem council that James even chimes in on. 
The answer is that our justification is simply by faith alone in Christ alone. Sola fide and solus Christus. Now that's really good news. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, let me repeat that. That is really good news. You do not have to rely on anything in and of yourself to be right with God. And here's why that's good news. You can't. (laughs) You can try and try, but it's like trying to dig a hole deeper to get out of the hole. It won't work. But praise God that Christ has filled that hole for you. Christ alone and faith in Him alone. The good news declares that Jesus has done for us and Himself what we cannot do by ourselves. But, according to these Judaizers, that good news is not good enough. Something more needs to happen for salvation. And and that something more is essentially, according to them, to become Jewish. Seen most symbolically in taking the sign of circumcision. Again, looking at the letter that Paul writes to the Galatians. this This is why... This different gospel is not really good news, but in fact, bad news. Listen to Galatians 5, verse 2 through 4. If you accept circumcision, says Paul, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to now keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Do you see? For Paul, the ground of your righteousness before God cannot be the law. Too grounded in the law, you are then required to keep the whole law. In other words, this covenant arrangement requires perfection. Do you want to start obeying the law? Then get ready to be prepared to give God a bill of perfection that you've kept it all because that's the only way that that channel will make you right and righteous before God. Absolute perfection. Any misstep, any failure, any broken commandment, not just in action, but even in thought, even if you've kept everything else, one mess up means you've failed entirely. You break one, you've broken them all, says Paul. And so, by submitting yourself to the law in order to be right with God by the law, you are essentially saying, Christ, you are not enough. Paul says, you've severed yourself from Christ. Think about that. If you get to heaven on the last day and God says, why should I let you into my presence? You say, well, you know, I believed in Jesus and I went to church, I evangelized, I made Wednesday night Bible study, I went to Sunday evening service, I gave a lot to the church. Uh, I helped the old lady across the street on uh, Saturday mornings every weekend. God says, really? You did all of that? (laughs) Yeah, I did. Then why did I send my son to die for you? If it was according to all of that. The Scottish Presbyterian John Colquhoun, writing in 1816... I think he gets it absolutely right when he says this. The great error of these Judaizers was that they did not believe that the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone was sufficient to entitle them to the justification of life. And therefore, they depended for justification partly, but also on their own obedience to the law. And by depending for justification partly on their own imperfect obedience to the law, They framed the law into this strange mix of covenants. First, a covenant of works. But such a covenant of works as would allow for some kind of imperfect instead of perfect works. And and by relying partly on the righteousness of Christ. And they mingled these two things together. The gospel and works. Faith and our works. All as the grounds of their justification. And thus they pervert both the law and the gospel. This motley covenant of works to live under is no covenant of grace at all. To reintroduce obedience to the law as the basis for your right standing before God is to undermine the necessity of Christ as your surety, as Christ as your only hope. You've diluted the new covenant of grace in Christ with a, with a mixture of works 
And when you dilute grace, you lose grace. And when you've lost grace, there is no grace. You've lost salvation. This is what Paul was warning the churches of. And you you see this in verses 3 and 4. Being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and, and they declared all that God had done with them. Of course it brought great joy, this conversion of Gentile sinners. Christ is saving to himself a multitude of of believers, and, and, and the only one to boast in is Christ. Think about it. A week before Paul came to any given city to preach to them the gospel, they were literally worshiping demonic idols, doing God-forsaken things in these temples, and offering up even children and sacrifice sometimes to these demonic gods. If anybody deserves the judgment of God, it's that. And here comes Paul and says, hey, believe in Jesus. He's died for you. And they do. And God fills them with the Spirit and accepts them. Ladies and gentlemen, that is joyful, joyful good news. If they can be saved, anybody can be saved. And yet, verse 5, here are these, these believers, Luke says, who belong to the party of the Pharisees saying, no, it's necessary to circumcise them. And to order them to keep the law of Moses. Incredible. Did you notice there in verse 5, Luke calls them believers? Did that strike you as odd? At this point, they are considered believers. And yet it's becoming apparent that they are believers who are grounding their faith in something wrong. In something divergent from what God has revealed. In other words, it's becoming more and more clear that they are believing in a heresy though they are not yet heretics. They're believing in a heresy, though they are not yet heretics. What do I mean? Well, I mean this. Almost all of us come into the faith not as well-formed theologians who have all the contours of the faith figured out. Praise God, you do not have to read all four volumes of Herman Bovink in order to become a Christian. No, you simply have to believe in Jesus Christ, and Christ will save you. So we come in as babes, and as such, almost all of us have mingled into our beliefs, let's be honest, something that's just not right. Some of those not right things tend to be low-level things, low-level issues. They're, They're wrong, but they don't ultimately matter when it comes to our salvation. But some of our wrong beliefs oftentimes are essential issues. They're central dogmas that we're getting wrong. That's heresy. And here's the thing, all of us have those at one time or another. We either haven't been rightly taught yet, or we haven't quite worked out how the gospel connects to that area, but as we grow and as the church teaches the Bible and we study the Bible and study our theology, by God's grace, we correct course and we exchange our wrong beliefs, our heresies, for right beliefs, orthodoxy. But here's where someone becomes a heretic. It's in that process, wherein they're rightly being taught the Word of God, but they instead dig their heels in, and even in light of the clear teaching of Scripture, in light of the overwhelming teaching of the church on this issue, teachings seen in creeds and confessions produced by the church, like here at Jerusalem, a heretic is someone who keeps claiming to represent Jesus Christ, but who consistently and persistently believes and teaches doctrines contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When that happens, the so-called believer has stepped into the dangerous category of becoming a, a heretic. Not only do they not have hope of gaining eternal life, uh, but more dangerously, they're leading others to do the same. Children, children, the very first question in your bulletin this morning asks this, what is a heretic? What is a heretic? And the answer is this. A heretic is someone who keeps teaching a wrong gospel. Keeps teaching a wrong gospel. And look, this this category of person has always been a danger within the church, has it not? 
It's one of the major ways Satan moves to get the church to be impotent in her efforts. Oh, are you guys really evangelistic? You love to send out missionaries? All right. Well, let me give you something else other than the gospel to send out. This is why Paul calls particular heresies doctrines of demons in 1 Timothy 4. And so the question is, what does the church do to defend itself against these pernicious heresies? Well, that's the next section we see in verses 6 through 18. We move from theological dissension and now theological discussion. Theological discussion. Verse 6. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. In other words, a theological council was convened to discuss this aberrant teaching, and it is no small matter that the church has always done this kind of thing ever since Acts 15. From the Jerusalem council seen here, to the council in Nicaea, which produces the Nicene Creed in the year 325, to the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith in 1689, to the very modern Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy, written in 1978. The church, in the face of dangerous but widespread confusion, has gathered to discuss and deliberate on what the Bible actually says, and then to produce some kind of creed, some pronouncement of orthodoxy, that hopefully the churches will say, ah, there it is, there's our right theology. What Luke records for us here are the speeches of three representatives of orthodoxy. First, a speech by Peter, then by Paul, and then by James. Peter begins by reminding everyone that he himself was called by God to preach to Gentiles, like we see he did to Cornelius. But second, Peter says, we know that this was accepted by God. Why? Verse 8, because God gave them the Holy Spirit, just like he did to us. God filled, as he did in the Old Testament temple, and as he did with the Jewish believers at Pentecost, those Gentile believers for doing nothing else but doing what? Simply believing the gospel. He gave them the Holy Spirit. And then third, verse 9, the only thing they did was believe. They, like us, were cleansed by faith. Sola fide. So the natural question arises for Peter, and he he poses it in verse 10. So now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Uh, This is a, a coup de grace of a question. If we as Jews could never have fully obeyed the law, and by the law ever assuredly stood righteous before God on account of the law. And remember, God promised to send the Messiah to save us precisely because of our inability to obey the law. If we couldn't do it, how do you expect the Gentiles to do it? No, says Peter in verse 11. We believe that we will be safe through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Sola gratia. Notice these are the last recorded words of Peter in the book of Acts. A man who believed we are saved by grace alone and Christ alone. There's the Roman Catholic Church's first pope. Children, your second question asks this. Why is the law a yoke of burden? Why is the law a yoke of burden? The answer is this. Because of our sin. Because of our sin. In other words, even though the law is good, and the law is good, it's God's law. Because of our sin, we are unable to fully keep it. Paul actually says in Romans chapter 5, verse 21, that it is the law through our sin that produces within us more disobedience. Staggering text. Uh, Just by way of analogy here, and this isn't even in my notes, but hopefully this hits and works. How many people came in here this morning tempted to go and take one of those chairs and just throw it through the window? Nobody. Nobody did. But if you came in here this morning and you saw behind me a massive sign that said, Commandment number one, thou shalt not throw chairs through the window. How many in here would be itching with a little bit of temptation? 
at least thinking, I wonder what that would feel like. Oh, the law, how it produces in you something that you didn't even know was already there, your sin. No, the law is good, but because of our sin, we are always unable to fully keep it. And, and look, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, yes, you are enabled now by the Spirit working in you to love God more. And by loving God, you grow in your ability to honor God and keep His commandments. Praise God for that. He doesn't leave you perpetually unable to walk in holiness. Still, and here's the big point of this counsel, our obedience is never the grounds of our salvation. Christ's obedience is always and only the ground and final hope of our salvation. Christ is the Savior, the author and perfecter of our faith. It is He who saves. It isn't even rightly our faith in Him that saves. Christ saves. And so why return ourselves to the law as a yoke of burden? Now, what does Jesus say? The law is burdensome, but come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, after Peter speaks, then Paul chimes in in verse 12, and, and here he tells the council all that God has been doing with the Gentiles through his ministry, him with Barnabas, the salvation of the proconsul in Cyprus, the revival scene in Lystra, the churches planted throughout southern Galatia, and the fact that God is allowing signs and wonders to take place in pagan places. Is that not evidence of God's accepting the Gentiles? It is. Still, the more important question is at hand, and it's gone unaddressed so far at the council. Do all these experiences square with Scripture? In other words, both Peter and Paul prove their case by what they've seen, and to be sure, that is significant. But more importantly, what does God's Word say? And here is where James, the brother of Jesus, stands up to speak and give a kind of final nail in the coffin of this controversy. And it's crucial that James speaks up here because, again, it very well may have been that these false teachers were, were pitting the preaching and teaching of James against that of Paul. Paul just speaks. Now James stands up, and I can almost imagine it now, the false teachers in the council thinking, ah, here he is, here's our guy. He'll finally stand up for the need for the Gentiles to submit to the law. We know James values obedience to the law of God. Look what James does at verse 13. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, that is Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets, that is the Old Testament, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it is written, after this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen, I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Here James brings the Old Testament scriptures to bear on this debate, and for James the evidence is absolutely clear. God has promised to restore the Davidic dynasty, the, the kind of apex of Jewish identity and culture. What Amos here, and this is what Eddie read for us earlier, what Amos calls the tent of David. God promises he will rebuild it, he will restore it, and when he does so, it will include within that kingdom not just Jews but Gentiles. Not just Jews who bow their knee to David's kingly descendant, but Gentiles too. And James is saying, friends, that's what's happening now, just as it is written. The book of Acts then is describing and showing how the Old Testament promises of restoring David's kingdom is now a reality. James's conclusion, if this is true, what does that mean? Verse 19 through 21. My judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. 
In other words, I agree with Peter, says James, and, and I agree with Paul. Gentiles do not need to be troubled with submitting to the Mosaic law and marking themselves out as truly saved and truly God's people through circumcision. O. Palmer Robinson, Robertson makes the striking point that if these Judaizers, Judaizers thought that there was still a further blessing in becoming Jewish, that there was, that there was something better about believing Jesus as a Jew, then shouldn't all believers want to also become Jews? Like, sure, there's grace in believing in Jesus. We're glad you believed in them, O Gentiles. And that's better than not believing at all. But if Jesus really wants to pour out his kingly blessings on the Jews, and it's possible to become a Jew through circumcision, then shouldn't every believer want to be a believer who is also Jewish? And he points out here that James's answer is no. No, now in Christ, we are not to trouble the Gentiles with this distinction. No, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. In Christ, all the promises of God find their yes and amen. Still, James warns. He warns them and he warns us that that doesn't mean that you can live however you want. You cannot live however you please. Gentile believers can remain Gentile, but they cannot remain pagan. That's what he says in verse 20, essentially. Gentiles don't need to be troubled by the Mosaic law, especially in its Jewish distinctions, but they ought to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what's been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has been had, read in every city, those who proclaim him. For he's read every Sabbath in the synagogues. All four of those practices, offering food to idols, temple sexual immorality, eating meat that's been strangled as offered to idols, and drinking blood, all of these things were associated with pagan temple worship. And James is saying, sure, you're not submitted to the old law of Moses, but you do have to live as new people in Christ. In other words, committing these things, of course, will not turn a believer into an unbeliever, right? Like, these aren't requirements for being saved. This is not a new law, as it were. If pagans stop doing these things, that doesn't mean they're now Christian. No, no. There's still unbelieving pagans who just happen to not worship at the temple anymore. Most Americans fit into that category. I don't know anybody that drinks blood or strangles goats to offer at the temple. Still, faith alone and Christ alone is what's required. And when that happens, when we follow Christ, we will of necessity more and more cease to look like the unbelieving world around us. I think James is pointing out here, you cannot follow Christ while simultaneously keeping one foot in the world. If the unbelieving world always has a pagan bent this way, following Christ will look different no matter what that paganism looks like. For Paul and James, it was drinking blood and, and temple sacrifices and immorality within the temple. For us, it's different. But you know what it is. Don't look like the world. Well, we've seen the theological dissension, theological discussion, and finally, the theological decision and its dissemination. Verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And so they sent them. And uh, skipping down to verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit... And to us, to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood, from what's been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Question. What effect do you think that this theological decision had on the church? In other words, here a very narrow theological decision has been made. A creed has been produced. And now it's going out to all the churches. My hunch is that the modern American answer would be like, oh, another creed, something else to just kill the vibe of the church. We don't need more creeds and confessions. We don't need more theology. We need more zeal and evangelism. 
How do they respond here? Look at verse 30 and 31. When they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Is that how you feel when some new theology has broken the publishing world and, and helped set the church astray? It does for me. It does for them. Friends, Luke is clear here. Theological clarity ought to be and is a source of joy and encouragement to believers. And of course it is because when we know for sure what God's Word teaches, it frees us up to pursue Christ in God's way, which is always for our good. Oh, dear friends, may we never, uh, we never drown under the false blanket of thinking that sharp theology is bad for the church. Well, I want to end here. Broadly speaking, there was theological unity. There was joy in the churches. Notice how chapter 15 ends with a disagreement and division. Look at verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought it best not to take with them one who had withdrawn. There arose a sharp disagreement, so they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him, sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, and they went the other way to Syria and Cilicia. So what gives? Here's this great chapter on theological and ecclesiological unity. And Paul and Barnabas were boys. I mean, these were close partners in the gospel who had suffered together for the gospel. What are we to make of a chapter which highlights the importance of unity, and yet here we see it end with disunity and division? Well, first notice that Luke gives no hint that either man here is wrong or is in sin. In fact, it seems that it's just the opposite. What they disagree over is not a matter of essential gospel doctrine, but now just a matter of mere practicality and pragmatic prudence. It's not over what the gospel is, but over a secondary issue of how best to get the gospel out. And so, in order to not hinder that gospel from going out, they decide to separate. Uh, friends, unity is good, but sometimes separation happens. And it doesn't mean that there's no deeper unity. Unity is not the same thing as uniformity. And sometimes the better decision for the gospel is that we come to a decision to go in separate ways. And I think today what that looks like is kind of like the difference between Presbyterians and Baptists. We are different churches. We have different convictions on what the church should look like and how it should be organized. We have a very significant difference on what to do with the children of believing parents. Should they be baptized or not? Baptists say no. Presbyterians say yes. And I will always have a gospel-believing Presbyterian boldly preach in this pulpit. And I'm gladly invited to come preach as a Baptist in Presbyterian pulpits because there's a deeper unity and we agree that the gospel goes out even though we separate on these secondary issues. Children, the last question in your bulletin this morning asks this. Is it okay to sometimes separate from other believers? And the answer is sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yes. If that surprises you, that sometimes it's okay to part ways for the sake of the gospel, well, just wait till you hear what Paul does at the very beginning of chapter 16, verse 1. Paul came to Derby, to Lystra, and there he meets a disciple named Timothy. Timothy, we're told here, is the son of a Jewish woman, but his dad was Greek, which means that he was not raised in the Jewish way, but in the Greek way, which means, in light of Acts chapter 15, he was not circumcised. But he was a believer in Christ, and he was well spoken of by the brothers. Verse 3, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. He wanted Timothy to grow as a preacher, to be mentored by him. So what does Paul do? Verse 3, he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. 
what? <laughs> I've just preached the longest sermon in Greenbelt Baptist history on the need to not circumcise because of Christ and Christ alone. And Paul was a major component in getting that agreement going. And immediately Luke writes the first thing that he does is he takes Timothy, whose father is Greek and he's not cir uh, circumcised, and he says, you need to go get circumcised. One, imagine that for an internship at a church. <laughs> Two, is this rank hypocrisy? No, it's not. Because Paul isn't saying, Timothy, you need to do this to be saved. He's already saved. He'll go to heaven. He's righteous in the eyes of God. No, it's because his mother was Jewish. And as Paul always did, he always went to the synagogues first. And he knew that if they knew about Timothy, they wouldn't let Paul and they wouldn't let Timothy in to preach the gospel. And so Paul says everything for the gospel. Timothy... This has nothing to do with your righteousness and salvation in Christ. It has everything to do with you dying to yourself and making sure we get the gospel to those who don't yet know it. He did it for the sake of the gospel. Paul was a reed who was willing to go this way and that in non-essentials, and yet at the same time an absolute iron pillar in the essentials of the gospel. So what does that mean for us? I think it means this, Greenbelt Baptist Church, may we be an iron pillar and do all that we can to get the gospel right. Because even if we get it subtly wrong a few degrees off, it will be another gospel. But secondly, may we stop at nothing to get the gospel out. When we have that gospel, what are you willing to give up? <laughs> or even in Timothy's case, cut off in order to get the gospel out. Let's pray.